I carelessly run the risk of sounding like the most unsociable person around as I dive headfirst into this episode of Why I Ride. So I'm going to say right here, right now, I'm really quite the opposite. Lisa, not so much. She likes her space and her peace much more than I care for it. Alas, she hooked up with me and her life has been sheer mayhem at times for long extended periods and countless nights that have run well into lunchtime the next day or even the day after that. Over the decades, our homes have always been a hub, a meeting place. We've had more friends stay, live and party in our homes than almost anyone else we've ever hung out with. Especially when we was in our 20s, our home regularly had 15 people over on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Weekdays down to a mere four to six. In our 30s, we still had many friends stay, lots of weekends and through odd parties. In our 40s, less, but you know, still folks around a lot of weekends, always cooking for friends. Twice a month, someone would wake up on our sofa, etc. After COVID ended, we threw two house parties in our apartment, 60 or 70 friends at each. I like people, I like hanging out, catching up, talking shit, seeing people laugh, seeing people bond. Jamming with friends on guitars, singing the night away. I'm sociable. To Lisa's disgust, she has been dragged along into this madness. At times, a living nightmare. At times, so much fun, our sides ached from laughing. I've been away a bunch of times with five to ten mates on motorcycle trips, be it just a night or two or ten days abroad. Was it fun? It most definitely was. Would I do it again? A hundred percent I would in a heartbeat. Does it give me the same satisfaction as going away by myself or with Lisa? Not even close, man. It's a different thing altogether and maybe I'm wrong to even compare. But I found myself thinking about these subjects and I know with certain friends the trials of the group road trips have often come up in conversation over a late night beer and we have laughed at a later date about what got on our tits back then on certain trips at the time. This is not intended as a knock at certain type of people but more a look at why touring in smaller groups is probably a wiser decision. Unless you have a bunch of friends that are all miraculously just the same as you, the same habits and the same personality and ways. Here is what bothers me about riding in large groups and why I'm not drawn back to it in a hurry. Have you ever been in the large motorway service station with eight people? Someone will always say, right, quick stop, fill up and let's go. We've got 400 miles to do. This is a true story. I fill up, pay, and I'm sat back on my chopper in under four minutes. I didn't particularly feel rushed. A couple of the guys do the same and then say, we're just going to go over there for a smoke. Two of the guys say they're going to go inside and grab a quick snack. Five minutes later and the guys smoking stroll back and we're all sat back on our bikes. After another five minutes rock by, one guy who went for a snack comes back hurriedly scoffing a burger. One of the smoking guys now fancies one. He goes inside and joins the large queue. The other smoking guy now needs a shit, so he goes inside too. Ten minutes later, both shit smoking guy and I want a burger smoking guy come back. The original guy who went in for a snack very mysteriously has not showed up. He has now been gone 25 minutes. I'm like, where is he? Shit smoking guy. Oh, you won't believe it, but he's sitting in the restaurant. He didn't want to take away. I look over to the window and see the guy making his way for a big dinner, taking his sweet time like it's at mum's house on Boxing Day or something. I think about starting smoking again. I think about a heroin or a healthy morphine addiction just for a moment. I get over this and think about the road. Okay, so we wait another 15 minutes for him to finish and he finally comes out. He strolls slowly over to us, pausing a few times to finish rolling a neat little cigarette. We are all sat on our motorcycles facing the exit biting our tongues because we are so English. He lights his cigarette and he walks the last few steps over to the meeting point. And as he gets to us, he takes a long, hard after dinner drag of the sweet golden Virginia tobacco. As he exhales the smoke, he joyfully chirps. Are we all here then? He finishes his smoke, climbs onto his motorcycle, and after a hunt through four or five pockets, he finds his key and turns the ignition. Then just before he hits the starter, he realises he has left his helmet and gloves on the table in the restaurant. He laughs loud and casually strolls back to the services entrance to make his way through the crowds into the restaurant. The smoker who didn't shit now feels movement. Fuck, I've got a shit. And so it went on. I tell it just like it happened. This is not made up. It was like a Monty Python sketch, except Monty Python is actually funny at the time watching it. This is only funny on reflection many, many years later. 
The other time it was just an hour sat in a garage forecourt when it could have just been said, look, you lot, I'm fucking hungry. I'm gonna sit down and have a good meal at a table. You can join me or stand out here holding your dicks for an hour. So that quick stop was definitely over an hour. Needless to say, we hardly covered any ground that day. This is how most stops went. You wake up in your tent. I'm an early riser. It's been said I'm an insomniac. I so often go to bed at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. just to get up at 5 or 6 a.m. That isn't right, but I can't change the lifetime's habit. But luckily a couple of my pals wake super early too. But for the most of them, if they crash at midnight, it's 9 or 10 a.m., open their eyes, talk about getting up for another hour, sit in their sleeping bags, holding their warm nuts for another 25 minutes, and then finally emerge, a lot of stretching and moaning, 40 minutes to make a cup of tea after borrowing a spoon, a cup, some sugar, and a coarser tea bag. Then two hours packing away, then got to eat something, because they didn't bring it, I think. Let's find a cafe, eh? You're not hitting the road to a Gary Cooper high noon or even much later. When I travel with Lisa or even my mate Dougal, we're on the road by 8 a.m., the latest. I've had two coffees, eaten well, washed, shit and shaved. Everything is packed tight. We are good and ready for a couple of hundred miles before pulling up again. I love the morning sun. I love a couple of hours riding before everyone is awake. So the early mornings away in large groups, I found somewhat frustrating. I'm not saying everyone should get up early. I'm not saying that at all. I'm aware I'm a freak, but I'm me. I'm stuck inside this freak and I'm happy inside here being freaky. I just can't waste four or five hours of my life one day, let alone multiple days, waiting for someone to get up, pack up, eat up and load up. By the time they're ready to go, I'd have been 250 miles away eating a fine lunch. The older I get, the less I like wasting time, the less I like putting myself in situations I don't want to be in. Time is more precious than gold. Time is everything there is. Time is ticking, reeling along, like a sweet, sad song. Time is a vinyl record that loops endlessly on a beautiful old jukebox. The ballad of time is always on, and they will still be dancing to it when you and I are dust in the wind. Now hear this, and I mean this 100%. I'm not saying this is how to do it, this is just how it suits me. This is my little film, my views. Not the gospel way of doing things, I'm not here to preach. This is not lean into the preacher. I can only talk about my take on shit because I am I. I understand full well if one of the folks I traveled with in the past made their own little film, they'd be saying how frustrating it was to go with me. Imagine being with someone that's twiddling on the guitar and humming at midnight, up at 5.30 firing up his jet bowl like a rocket ship at dawn frying bacon at 6am, packing his tent at 6.30, then talking about doing 200 miles before lunch. What an arsehole. I wholeheartedly agree. I sound like a bad dream. What are we going to eat? I like food. Food is important to me. My mum was a magnificent cook. She made her own bread and homemade just about everything. I learned to cook from a very young age. I left home at 16 and I had to eat good food. I don't mind junk food. If I'm in a rush, I'll eat it. But if I'm passing through a town and there's a nice restaurant and I'm in a strange country, I want to try their cuisine. Some folks just seem to begrudge themselves this pleasure. They'll happily spend 50 pound on beer without contemplation, but 20 pound on a steak, that's too much. I'll just get a bag of chips, thanks. The food discussions can be insane. And then bill splitting. We all just go Dutch. All pay the same, no matter what you've eaten or not eaten. And that's the only way you can really do it without a flaff. And as someone who doesn't drink alcohol, I never moaned about chipping in for bottles of beer or bottles of wine or whiskies and brandies, etc. Then you have the problem of when are you going to eat? Some people want to do lunch at 12, some at 3, some at 4, dinner at 6 or dinner at 9. I'm hungry, I'm not hungry, I'm dying of hunger and so on and so on. Riding with people that are bent out of shape. This isn't a knock at drinkers. When I drank, I drank, I got messed up. I loved drinking, I couldn't stop. But I could still function. I still got up at sunrise. I still went to work every day. I never really entertained hangovers. I had them, but I'd never let them kick my ass. Until the end of my drinking career when I was always doing coke, they really did start to kick the shit out of me. I stopped. But for the most of my drinking career, I was champ. I went to work, I could ride, I could drive. I wasn't moody, I was just me. 
Some people just cannot function on a hangover. It destroys them. Watching someone bent out of shape, trying to pack away their gear, tent, etc., throw up in a toilet, get their stuff strapped on a motorcycle, try and ride, then you see them weave side to side, 10 yards in front of you on the road. Then their pack comes loose, hanging off the bike. You know if it drops, you're gonna have to slam on your brakes. It's tense, man. It leaves me tense. I didn't give a shit when I was drunk. Now I can see a bit more clearly, I just gets me thinking, if you can't handle it, slow up on tour, man. What's the point of planning to drive across the country, then getting so messed up every day you're in agony every minute of the ride? Surely, ride to the final destination, get totally trashed a few days, and then rein it in back in time to get home. I wasn't born to follow. I like to make my own decisions. Am I a control freak? No, I don't think so. But I don't like doing shit I don't want to do. I didn't when I was younger, unless now I'm older. When I'm away on a group trip, it's like that question, where shall we go today? I don't want to go for that long. I just want to do 100 miles and then hit a bar, get messed up. It's too hot there, beach isn't for me. You don't even know what's in that water. I hate mountain roads, no head for heights. I can't do motorways. My stepmother's cousin's neighbor was killed on the M1, I'm out. I don't want to go anywhere there's no McDonald's. I can't eat any foreign crap. Please, 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 can we just take a road without any white lines? I've had no coke for five days. If I see one more white line, I'm getting off my bike, on my knees, rolling up my 50 and gonna hoover that bastard up. Before you know it, you've done an hour and 53 minutes deciding where you're not gonna go. And you've still got to decide where you are gonna go. That's 70 miles you're not doing today. You know what else is a drag? Losing people at traffic lights. You will all try and stop, but there's a car up your ass. The car that weaved around your friend when he stopped instantly on the orange light. But there's nowhere to pull up. You go a mile further and wait in a lay-by. It's pure logic. They'll come by. We haven't turned off the main road. They'll see us clear as day. They don't show. You call them, but their phone is dead. You volunteer to ride back and you find him sitting outside a shop with a flat white and a smoke. He says, I knew you'd find me. Responsibility of others. I've had kids, man. It's always the ones that have not had kids that fucking lose themselves. They get lost in a supermarket. They get lost on a beach. They get lost in a campsite. They'll even get stuck inside their sleeping bags because the zip broke. They forgot their phone chargers. That's why their phone is dead. You lend them yours and within two hours they broke your lead. They forgot to bring a cup and a plate and didn't dream they'd need waterproofs in France. Dry bag, what exactly does that do? You can write a list for people, a guide of what you might need on a trip, but they didn't think you were actually serious about all that shit. The fact I called my first motorcycle my bullshit escape machine should have told me everything I needed to know about motorcycles. Escaping bullshit. Most cars have five seats, some have seven or even eight. Public transport groups together hundreds of people at a time. Do a long journey with four people in the car. Feel the tension rising like a bad black cauldron, especially if it's a multiple day trip. It's just a matter of time before things start bubbling over. Look at the faces on the subway trains. Look at the faces on any train, miserable as sin. Takes the slightest thing and it's kicking off. Everyone is so tense, everyone wants out. You can hear the oppressed voices in each mind screaming, kill. And then way back when someone invented a motorcycle, they stuck one tiny little seat on the thing, got on it and went for the first ride and screamed, man, this is beautiful. I mean, it was obviously based on a bicycle and bicycles had one seat. But on a motorcycle, you could go far, far away and with much more ease. You weren't busting your balls to get there. You were in some kind of relative peace, just rattling along to the rhythm of the engine. You wasn't thinking my calves are about to explode or my knees are shattering bit by bit. Two wheels, an engine and a tin of gas, a rolling bomb with one glorious seat. It was something for a solo experience. Motorcycles haven't really changed, that's the idea, man. Okay, obviously it wasn't long before a pillion seat was added. It was probably only a matter of weeks after motorcycles were invented that someone wanted to share the experience. But back then and the same now, you don't just put anyone on the back of your motorcycle. I mean, unless it's a situation. Like if a pal broke down, of course they're gonna jump on. You're gonna help them out. But as a rule, I don't think many dudes have dudes jumping on the back of their bikes, nuts to butt, up tight, just for the hell of it. I think for the most of us, we are picky picky about who's throwing a leg over the back of our bike and hugging up tight. 
I have to be very chill with someone if they're getting on the back of my bike. I've heard it a lot. You kind of have these people you know, but not know well. They're not motorcyclists, car people. And the minute they see your bike for the first time, they're like, hey, you've got to take me for a ride. And it's awkward as fuck. Inside your head, it screams, shit, fuck that. I don't even know you. It's not going to happen. If you're on the back of my motorcycle, it's one of two things. We are tight or you are in a tight situation. That's the end of it. There is no middle ground. Benefits of traveling solo or as a pair, and I reiterate, only as a pair if you're real tight, and I mean on the same page, not even page, the same paragraph, in unison like the bouncing ball dot on a karaoke screen. You have to bounce man, you have to bounce tight. Captain America and Billy, Lone Ranger and Tonto, Batman and Robin, Bonnie and Clyde, Cheech and Chong, Kerouac and Cassidy, Romeo and Juliet, Clarence and Alabama. You have to wake a similar time, have similar energy, humour, food taste, hotel taste, campsite choice, mileage, stamina. Travelling with Lisa or solo, I can stay up late, I can find peace to write, I can find peace to play my guitar, to draw, to not have to make small talk, to shut the fuck up and watch the world breathe. Watch a tree grow, a wave crash, a bird soar high, sunrise, sunfall, clouds roll down from a mountain top. A spider weave its mysterious web in the morning dew. The cornfields bend under a warm summer wind. A fisherman carrying his catch to a chef in a small village restaurant. A young couple talking dreams over on a quiet beach at dusk. Befriend a lonely dog and feed him well. Tell him he's beautiful. Tell him he's a good boy and love him, if only for a while. Look up at the moon and marvel at the stars. Thank the gods and your ancestor angels for the moment you are in. Sing a prayer for your children. Whisper out across the sea that you love them endlessly. And just love this life, man. Love this fragile, beautiful life of yours.